Hey everyone, Jared Sandler here. I'm joined by the Hall of Famer Eric Nadell for some baseball talk. Hopefully we can get the baseball season started in July as people have discussed, get an agreement between the players and the owners and just get this ship going. But uh, until then, figured we'd have some fun baseball conversations, taking a look at the past. And Eric, this is the week that Jose Canseco uh, had, had an interesting journey in the outfield and then on the mound and uh, probably not exactly what he wanted to be remembered for. I don't think you could have a worse week than this week for Jose Canseco back in 1993. You know, today was the day that the fly ball off the bat of Carlos Martinez went off his head and over the fence uh, at Cleveland Municipal Stadium. And, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't a great day for me either. I was calling that play, and it was very dark in that stadium. That's my excuse. I couldn't really tell what happened uh, out at the wall there. I wasn't looking on the TV monitor, and I should have been. Um, but I think my call went something like, there's a fly ball in deep right field, and Canseco's back at the wall, and it is off the wall and over the wall. <laughs> How'd that happen? And then it wasn't until we saw the replay that we realized exactly what had happened, and it were kind of in disbelief. The thing about Canseco is he was a very good sport when it came to making fun of himself. You know, he, there was never any reluctance on his part to do that. And then of course, just a few days later, when Kevin Kennedy decided that Conseco would pitch in a game, and we saw this one coming. Uh, I actually did the manager show that day with Kevin. The Rangers had been blown out the day before and they had been blown out a few times that week. And he was really upset with the performance of the bullpen. And, he said that this kind of thing happens again. He said, I'll put Conseco on the mound. And then wouldn't you know it, that very day, the Rangers were getting blown out in a Saturday afternoon game at Fenway. And we see Conseco warming up in the bullpen. And, you know, as it happened, the Rangers were at bat for a really long time in that inning. And Conseco wound up blowing out his arm while he was warming up before he even got to the mound. Uh, we knew something was wrong when he got to the mound. He didn't really look like he was in pain, but we had seen him throw in the bullpen before, and he had decent stuff. And when he got to the mound, you know, he, he had nothing. He was just lobbing the ball in. And he wound up missing the rest of the season. You know, Tommy John surgery out for the rest of the year. Uh, it did set up a great comeback the next year when he was the comeback player of the year. But uh, that was the end of the 93 season, uh, having played not even two months. Was Jose Canseco a, a well-liked teammate? He was. Um, and we, we were all, um, I guess, somewhat surprised at that. You know, we didn't know exactly what to expect. And I remember the day that he arrived after the trade uh, from Oakland. And he was traded, you know, for a few players, including uh, Bobby Witt and Ruben Sierra, um, both really popular guys on the team. And when Canseco joined the team, it was in New York. We were about to start a series at Yankee Stadium. We were in Kansas City the day of the trade, playing the final game of the series, then headed to New York. And Canseco showed up. The club was already in the clubhouse, getting ready for batting practice. And he walked into the clubhouse carrying a cell phone. It was the first time I'd ever actually seen a cell phone. And this thing was as big as a brick. It was like the one that Michael Douglas used in the movie Wall Street. That's the first time I'd ever seen one even uh, on film. And he had that same model. I think it was the only one that was made back then, weighed about 10 pounds. And he walked into the clubhouse actually having a conversation with somebody on that cell phone. And we were all thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, what's this all about? And when we got on the bus after the game, went back to the hotel, all of a sudden there were, you know, hundreds of fans waiting for the Rangers to get off the bus, which, you know, hadn't really happened that much, you know, for our club. No one was about the only guy who ever attracted autograph seekers. But all of a sudden, here's Conseco, you know, with dozens and dozens of people waiting for his autograph. And, you know, it kind of changed the nature of who the Rangers were to the general public. So when you look back on Conseco's career, he won an MVP. He was like a six-time All-Star. I think he had over 450 home runs. He had really good numbers and, and the achievements were, uh, you know, what a lot of guys would, would love to have when they call it quits. But do you think he, and I know there were some enhancements that took part in this, but did he, did he achieve 
his full potential or do you think that uh, he could have done even more? Cause I just, you know, and I don't really remember a whole lot about him playing back in his prime. I, my memories are more like towards the tail end, but like I always hear these stories and see videos like this incredibly gifted athlete, not only the strength, but the speed. And I just, I guess I'm curious your perspective as someone who saw his entire career. Yeah, he was a true five-tool guy. He was a good defensive player. He had a great arm. Um, he was a tremendous base stealer. You know, he could do all of that. He didn't quite have the longevity that some players had. He wound up being injury prone later on in his career. Whether or not that was related to all the steroid use or not, we don't really know. There's a good chance it was. Um, but in that regard, he didn't have the kind of career that we all expected him to have. Uh, in his prime, though, he was about as good as any outfitter, you know, that I had seen. You know, we, you would make the exceptions for Ken Griffey Jr. and, you know, in my case for Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle, guys like that. But not very many guys, I would say, were better all-around players than Jose Canseco when he first joined the A's those first few years. And you mentioned Ruben Sierra because he was a part of that trade and had a few stints with the Rangers he had such a wacky career too because it was so promising and then it just it, it reached a, an impasse and then he came back and was good but uh, I guess he's a guy that maybe more so than than a lot of Rangers kind of left you wondering what if right yeah definitely and you know in his case too you know the presumption is that uh, using performance enhancing drugs was was bad for him we actually saw that while with the Rangers you know, he almost won the MVP award, uh, lost out to uh, Robin Yount, and decided that offseason that he needed to hit more home runs. And all of a sudden, he showed up at spring training the next year looking like the Michelin man. Yeah. You know, he had put on this 30 pounds of muscle, but he couldn't move the same way, couldn't throw the same way, and wasn't the same player. And, you know, he pretty much you know, damaged his own career uh, while in his prime by thinking he had to be better. And that was really unfortunate because he, you know, he had all the tools as well. Anything else stand out to you about that fateful week for Jose Canseco and, you know, the, the stuff that's talked about or maybe stuff that's not talked about as much? Um, I think the connection with Kevin Kennedy was probably the, the part of that week that wasn't talked about enough. Uh, you know, he was, he was a new manager with the Rangers and very different from previous guys we had had. He was extremely outspoken uh, and extremely competitive, really fiery. Um, I don't know if moody was the right word. Uh, but again, the decision to use Canseco in that game was almost a result of his being angry at everybody else. Um, he was a motivator in a very different way than other managers that we had had. And remember, he followed Bobby Valentine, but in between Valentine and Kennedy was Toby Hara, who was more of a laid back, you know, players manager, if you would. And, you know, Kennedy in 93 had a club that it didn't really have a very good pitching staff. The Rangers you know, weren't real good. Uh, the following year in 94, they weren't great either, but they were better. And they were actually in first place in the division when the big strike came in August and ended the season. They were, I think, 10 games over 500, but that was good enough at that point to lead the division. And, you know, Kennedy had a, uh, a very unique managerial style, but when he was replaced, uh, Doug Melvin hired Johnny Oates, and that was, a, again, a major change in managerial style. And I think that tends to be the case when teams change managers. They, they go 180 degrees from the previous guy. All right, it was this week to branch out beyond just the Rangers. It was this week in 1968 that uh, Montreal and San Diego were awarded franchises. It was decided upon they would they would get them. Obviously, uh, they uh, you know they didn't just all of a sudden join the season in the middle of the year. Uh, there's been talk about expansion in Major League Baseball, and you know whether or not it happens. Uh, maybe it's it's more of a matter of of when, not if, but. What, what are the, is there a city or two cities that really stand out to you that you'd like to see get an MLB team? Well, it's funny. I'd like to see Montreal get one back. I don't think that's going to happen because of the TV market, you know, not adding anything to the, to the owner's package in the United States, uh, being a Canadian city. 
Um, I think Las Vegas has to give it a team in the next expansion. You know, they've shown that they can support major league sports. And I think the hesitation about exposing players to gambling uh, just is a non-factor now. There are casinos every place. There's sports betting. Um, I mean, DraftKings is a major sponsor of Major League Baseball. You know, to say we shouldn't have a team in Las Vegas because of gambling is absurd. Uh, so I think that's the automatic one. Uh, after that, uh, I'm not sure, you know, what the best place would be. People talk about North Carolina, potentially, uh, Nashville, potentially. Obviously, San Antonio is a potential market. I don't imagine the Astros would be real excited about that. I'm not sure the Rangers would be real excited about that either. Um, I don't know that Portland uh, could actually support a major league team. So I'm not sure there's an obvious choice. You know, Buffalo, maybe. Um, but to me, to me, Las Vegas is a slam dunk. And then after that, you wait and see what kind of presentations you get from the cities that are interested. Who do you think, what other city do you think? You think Orlando? Well, or would that take too much away from Tampa, St. Pete? Yeah, that, I, I wasn't thinking Orlando, although, you know, that's, uh, I, I think the, the, the setup and the facilities would be easy to come by. And, you know, uh, you probably need a roof there because of the weather. So you, you hit on some of the cities. I wonder if, you know, Indianapolis, I think, has always been a pretty good AAA city. Uh, would there be anything there or are there, are there hurdles that you think would make that uh, a tough one to – I'm just thinking of other cities that weren't mentioned. Yeah, and Indianapolis, you know, has supported uh, basketball and, and football, obviously. I don't know what the uh, potential for luxury box sales is there compared to other cities. That always seems to be – you know, one of the deciding factors uh, with the economics of baseball these days. What about, okay, what about a team in Puerto Rico or, or even like Mexico City? Um, there too. I don't know if the economics are there for that sort of corporate support. Um, Mexico City is large enough, you would think, that there's enough business there. I don't know about the safety factor. For the players right now, Mexico is a pretty pretty dangerous place. You know, I don't know how much the players would have to uh, stay close to the hotel and to the ballpark there, but uh, certainly a possibility. I don't see the economics working in Puerto Rico. I, I don't see that kind of uh, corporate support yeah. that you would need there. It'd be fun to go there, though. It would it would be fun, and you know what? I bet. It would be an incredible environment with the, you know, the energy that they all have at those, uh, you know, at those, uh, at those facilities and those games we've seen from the World Baseball Classic. Uh, all right, last one for you, uh, and this is more current day baseball. Uh, when you think about, I don't think we've had a chance to talk about this 82 game schedule proposal and, uh, you know, the, the fact that teams are only going to play teams in their division and the counterpart in the other league and all that stuff. What are the things that really stand out to you of interest uh, as far as the proposal uh, that's been put together for the potential season? Well, this regional travel thing to me is interesting, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm in favor of it in any way. Uh, I understand they want to limit the travel, but honestly – you're talking about charter flights and whether you fly for two hours or three hours or four hours, I don't think that really is going to make any difference. So I'm really surprised that baseball is setting it up this way. Uh, obviously it's not very good in the Rangers case, given the fact that the majority of the teams the Rangers will be playing will be West coast teams. <laughs> Hopefully it'll cause a change in the game times. I would expect that when the Rangers play in the Pacific time zone, those games would start at six o'clock not at seven o'clock so that our TV and radio audience would have an eight o'clock game at home. And my guess is the Rangers would have to do the same thing for them. We'd probably start all the games at eight o'clock so that on the West coast games wouldn't be starting at five when people aren't home yet, they'd be starting at six. Uh, that's not ideal in either case, but I think that's probably what they'll have to do. Um, I don't understand why they don't just play an American league schedule, you know, get rid of the interleague games and you know, do an unbalanced schedule. You play most of the games in your division, but you at least play one series against all of the teams in your league. You may play 
you know, you play half the teams at home, play half the teams on the road and accommodate it that way. I, I don't understand why they're doing it the way they are, where there's going to be no commonality in the schedules and you're going to be competing for a wild card berth against teams that don't play any of the teams that you play. There's zero. Um, that bothers me. Uh, I was a little surprised at the 82 game schedule instead of a 100 game schedule, for example, especially since they're talking about expanded rosters. You know, if you can have 28 or 30 men on your roster and you can change your roster every day using that 50 player pool, you could easily play a double header every week. You know, that would be, that would be a piece of cake. And you could easily go over the course of a 12 week season from 82 games to 94 games, um, you know, squeeze out another one every now and then, and you could get a 100 game schedule. And, and all of a sudden the players have added another 25% to the number of games they're getting paid for, uh, which might solve some of the financial issues between the players and the owners, so obviously. Not the big one, but uh, at least it would be a step in the right direction. And, and maybe in the ultimate solution, they'll wind up with something closer to a 100-game schedule. You mentioned the imbalanced schedules. It, forget this year, but moving forward, uh, and, and what we you know, hope, to be, or hope to have full seasons in subsequent years, would you be in favor of A, uh, getting rid of the division – uh, the division tilt where you end up playing way more against your division than other teams. And B, I, I don't know what the math would be. I think you'd have to have a 32 team league to maybe make it work out a little better, but would you be interested in, in whatever the, the setup would need to be from like a, a numbers standpoint to where you get rid of divisions, you've got the American and national league, Everyone in the American League plays everyone in the American League the same amount of time, same in the National League. And the top, you know, what do we have, five teams right now make the playoffs. The top three are, quote, unquote, the, the division winner spots. And then the fourth and fifth seeds play each other in that play-in game. I just – I understand divisions, and I know that it, it in theory, kind of helps with travel, but, like, it doesn't help the Rangers. Uh, and, you know, somehow we're – I think Dallas is the only – DFW is the only sports market, and we talked about this, that has a team in one sport in the Eastern <laughs> Division, and the Cowboys yeah. are in the NFC East, and then a team in another sport that's uh, got the Western region with the AL West. The Stars used to be in the Pacific Division, which made absolutely no sense. The only sport that gets this right is the NBA, but what's weird about that is uh, I don't think Oklahoma City's in the, the, the Mavericks Division, but at least the Mavs are – in a division of teams in their area, but w would you be in favor of getting rid of divisions and just having a totally balanced schedule within your league? I prefer the divisions. I think it's easier for fans to follow what's going on. Uh, I know even in trying to figure out who's going to be in the playoffs in hockey, I'm constantly confused with them coming from different divisions. Um, I like the divisions, but I don't like the unbalanced schedule the way it is. I don't think you should play 19 times. Uh, within your division. You know, that could easily get cut down to the way it used to be where you play maybe 14 times and instead of playing seven games against the teams outside your division, six or seven or eight, you play 10 or, you know, against the teams outside your division or you play 11 or, or you play some of them, you know, nine times and some of them 11 times uh, and you have three series against those teams and you'd alternate year to year. This year, we play the Yankees twice at home and once there and, and the reverse. That's how it used to be. And now that there's a wild card and you're competing for playoff spots against teams outside the division, it, it makes more sense than ever to not have the play as unbalanced. But I don't know that I'm necessarily in favor of a totally balanced schedule. I think it should just be less unbalanced. I still like the fact that the Rangers are going to play the Astros more than they're going to play the Yankees and more than we're going to play, you know, Tampa Bay. Eric, you're in Colorado. I hate to take you away from the, the beautiful Colorado outdoors, but thanks for, uh, thanks for hanging out with us and we'll, uh, we'll do this again soon. Thanks. Hopefully we'll be doing baseball games before too long.